The restrainer. Who is the restrainer? The one who restrains Antichrist, or actually restrains Satan from coming to full power in the person of Antichrist. I authored a book, I think it may be out there, Shadows of the Beast, how the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church. And it's a quite involved subject. Obviously, it ultimately climaxes with his entering the temple, taking his seat and demanding to be worshipped as God, and being identified by the number 666. But that will not be all that easy. It will not be all that simple. He's going to be much more clever than that, know how to well masquerade himself and camouflage his agenda. None of the wicked will understand, Daniel tells us. Only the wise will count the number of his name and know how to do it. Now some people will claim, well that's about the tribulation saints. We won't be here then or that will happen after the rapture. Well if the tribulation saints had any wisdom they wouldn't be here either. Why would the Lord warn so much about something that doesn't pertain to us? But that's another issue. Who is the restrainer? Who is the one who restrains? There is a view that has a fair amount of truth in it. That the Antichrist will of course counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus. He'll counterfeit Christ generally. He comes on a white horse. In the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, he's the first horse showing up in the book of Revelation counterfeiting Jesus coming on a white horse later on in the book of Revelation. He's a counterfeiter. And his ultimate feat will be to counterfeit the resurrection. Satan is cast down from heaven, and when Satan comes down and inhabits the corpse of Antichrist and it counterfeits the resurrection, you will be essentially, or people will essentially be looking at Satan incarnate. Just as Jesus was God incarnate, the resurrected Antichrist will in effect be tantamount to an incarnation of Satan. A frightening prospect. A very frightening prospect. Now what makes this prospect so frightening is the following. Jesus told us repeatedly, be alert. When you see these things coming, be alert, be alert. Watch for these signs. Contemporary events in the Middle East being among them, but that's not the only one. If you had asked me 25, 30 years ago why I believe this time in history was different than the other times in history, I would have pointed out that there's not only a globalization of the world economy, a destruction of the environment, not only are the countries in the Roman Empire reconfederating into a non-democratic Europe and things of that nature, I would have pointed to the fact that this is the first time in history, as we looked at last night, that the Jews have been back in their ancient homeland as Jesus three times directly and overtly predicted would happen. Again, I refer you to last night's recording. However, there's something else. The clearest sign today that I can see of the return of Jesus, although all of those things remain absolutely true, in fact I'm more convinced of their veracity as signs of the last days than I've ever been. Although all those things are true, all of them. If you would ask me today why I really believe Jesus is coming, it is the level of deception within the body of Christ. Jesus warned in the Olivet Discourse of wars one time, rumors of wars one time, famines one time, pestilence one time, seismic activity and earthquakes one time. All these things one time, one time, one time, one time. He warned of deception perpetrated against believers four times. He warned about deception in the church four times more than he warned us about anything else. That's quite a thing. Quite a thing. We see <clears throat> incipient persecution already beginning. Across the border in the state of Washington, Yesterday, a Jewish couple who are believers in Jesus owned a bakery. Messianic Jews owned a bakery, and finally they're forced to close it down because it was against their convictions to make a wedding cake for a lesbian wedding. They said, we cannot be party to this, we'll suffer the financial loss, and they were sued and fined astronomically, forced out of business. In a court in Canada nearly 10 years ago, 
a Canadian pastor was fined $15,000 for inside of his church reading Romans chapter 1 following a complaint by homosexuals that he committed a hate crime. Uh, persecution is coming. Yet instead of being prepared for persecution, people are being told other things. Instead of watching for these signs, people are being prepared to be deceived. I'm only quoting him directly. I'm only quoting him directly. Rick Warren teaches, this is his teaching, avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Jesus said, be alert, and he reiterated it, be alert, watch out for these things. You're going to be persecuted by all nations. Remember, the freedom you have in countries like Canada and the United States are a historical anomaly. Most believers in most countries through most of the history of the church have been persecuted. You want to see the reality, come with me next month to Vietnam. I'll show you what it's like for most Christians, and has been. More Christians have been persecuted, more Christians have been martyred in the last 60 years than in the entire history of the church put together. It's going on daily. But because people in the Western world and the Protestant democracies forget that our freedom that came mainly from Great Britain was bought by the blood of martyrs like Ridley and Latimer and Hooper and Cranmer and William Tyndale. The freedom we have in Canada or the States is a historical anomaly. It's not normal. It's not a historical norm. And now that countries like America and Canada and Britain have turned away from the faith of their forefathers, that freedom is disappearing rather quickly. We've got godless courts, godless politicians, because you've got godless churches. The church is no longer salt and light to the degree it once was. Persecution is coming. Jesus said, beware of these things. Rick Warren says, no. Forget about what Jesus Christ said. Listen to me. Don't read this. Don't pay attention to what this says. Read the purpose-driven lie. Avoid end times prophecy. It's a diversion. Yeah, but Jesus said, and he said it twice, Be, beware, watch for... Forget about Jesus. Listen to Rick. Who needs Jesus Christ when you have Rick Warren? One of them is a liar. One of them is a liar. Either you should put a match to the Bible, or you should put a match to the purpose-driven lie. But one of them is a liar. Now, as one who will give testimony before the judgment seat of Christ, I tell you this. Rick Warren is on Satan's payroll. That man works for the devil. He's an agent of hell to deceive the elect, and he's only one of many. I'll debate him anytime, anywhere, as long as it's in front of a video camera. Don't tell me I don't love. If I didn't love the body of Christ, I wouldn't care what Christians believed. But they need to be prepared for what's coming, not left unprepared. We should listen to Jesus, Amen. not to deceivers. He told us to be alert, to be watchful for certain signs. And those signs are happening. They're unfolding in Europe, in the Middle East, and in the body of Christ. They're unfolding right under our noses. Who is the restrainer? What is stopping Satan from coming to full power? There are three primary things that restrain Satan. Three primary things. One is human government. Now Romans chapter 1 tells me that people who condone homosexuality will suffer the same judgment as them that God gives them over to it. Barack Obama, in all likelihood, is going to hell. He's in all likelihood going to hell, according to Romans 1. It is very unlikely somebody like that will get saved because God has given him over to think these things are right and to support it. It's not me saying it. Romans 1 says, in all likelihood, that man will spend eternity in the pit and lake of fire. 
but I pray for him. I had quite a lot of respect for Mr. Harper in this country. Quite a lot of respect. He supported Israel. He seemed to at least have Judeo-Christian moral values and things of that nature. This present individual, I don't like him any more than I like this father. But he is the Prime Minister of Canada and I would urge you to pray for him. Because if these politicians are not influenced by our prayers, they will be influenced by something much more sinister, I assure you. Human government is a vehicle that God uses to restrain evil to a degree. Second, a spirit, Holy Spirit empowered church preaching the gospel. A Holy Spirit empowered church preaching the gospel. That preaching of the gospel by an empowered church to a degree restrains evil. You just think, for instance, of Germany. <clears throat> when higher criticism, liberal theology, came out of the universities of Germany, like Tübingen, when 19th century German rationalism that had roots in people like Kant and Hegel came into the world of theology, and they began doing theology as 19th century German rationalist philosophy, influenced strongly by Darwinism. The Moravians and the Pietists and the more conservative uh, people in the Stadtenkirch, the conservative Lutherans, they all declined. Germany's church became liberal. It was only Catholicism in Bavaria and liberal Protestantism. Um, 11 of the 14 evangelical Lutheran bishops supported the Third Reich. It was over. What did Germany do once the preaching of the gospel went down? They went back to their old Teutonic religions, didn't they? The Blitz, the Holocaust. <laughs> once the gospel is no longer preached by a Holy Spirit empowered church, nations are going to go into reprobation. They're going to go into reprobation. That's the second thing. The third thing that stops the full empowerment of Satan on the earth that restrains it, not stops it, but restrains it, is the restrainer, the katiko, the katiko in Greek. Okay. When Antichrist comes, by economic and political and religious means, the governments of the world are going to come under his control. The religions of the world will merge into a false religious system in the character of ancient Babylon, the Tower of Babel and the Babylonian Empire we call Babylon the Great. That will be his footstool. The false prophet will head the religious system Antichrist will head the political economic system. Okay. That leaves the restrainer. But we're told the restrainer will no longer restrain. Now again, understand what's happening. Babylon the Great. As we pointed out last night, Moses was clear. Other gods were shedim in Hebrew. Demons. Paul was clear in Corinthians. Other gods are demonoi, demons. All right, Krishna is a demon. Rama, Shitra, Shiva, Allah, the Nabataean moon god, these are demons. Now you've got Christians practicing Chrislam, trying to identify Allah with the god of Israel. My Arabic is not fluent, but I do know Arabic. As a generic term for God, Allah is a word for God. But as a proper noun, as a name, it's not Yahweh. Allah was the name of the Nabataean moon god. Yet you've got people saying, oh, it's the same god. You've got people saying, oh, Mormons are Christians. Mormons are Christians? Our Jesus is the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. The Mormons say that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. 
That's what it says in the Book of Mormon. That's what it says. The real Jesus said, many will come in my name claiming to be him. Many will come claiming to be him. I'm only stating facts. I'm telling you what happened. Please do not believe me. Please do not take my word for a syllable of this. Go on Google and see it and watch it for yourself. Don't believe me. Don't take my word. Go on Google. Watch it for yourself. You had Sun Young Moon, the Korean, claiming to be the Lord of the Second Advent. In other words, the return of Christ. He said that Jesus Christ failed in his first coming, so now he's going to succeed where Jesus failed. He's the return of Christ. A literal self-confessed antichrist who identified his wife as the Holy Spirit. This was Moon. A cult leader. Don't laugh. When finally criminally convicted in the States for financial impropriety, sent to federal prison, the author of the Left Behind series, Tim LaHaye, attempted to organize 300 major evangelical leaders to volunteer to go to federal prison in solidarity with Moon. Jerry Falwell, the president of Liberty University, took $2.3 million from Moon and embraced him and called him an unsung hero. You've got major evangelical leaders embracing antichrists, self-confessed antichrists. If possible, the elect will be deceived. These things are unbelievable. I'm only stating facts. Do we have any former Roman Catholics here? I asked this last night. Any people who used to be Roman Catholic, put your hand up, please. Again, don't believe me, ask them. The Roman Catholic Church teaches transubstantiation. The bread and wine becomes Jesus Christ incarnate. They worship it. They say he dies again sacramentally. Then they eat his flesh and drink his blood in a cannibalistic ritual called the Mass. The apostles condemned the consumption of blood in Acts 15, didn't they? If it's his real blood, why are you drinking it? That's vampire religion. It's literally Dracula is a vampire religion. It's, it's, well, our Jesus said, if anybody says, I have returned physically, don't believe it, it's Antichrist. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. He's in the wilderness, don't believe it, don't go there. If anybody says, I've returned, I'm coming back the way I went. If anybody says, I've come back in any other way, don't believe it, get away from them. But every time there's a mass, the Roman Catholic Church says, Jesus Christ has returned physically under the appearances of bread and wine. That's a whole nonsense in itself. They literally worship it as Christ God incarnate. I'm only stating facts. The Eucharistic Christ of Rome is not the real Jesus. The Yeshua, Yesu of Islam, a prophet inferior to Muhammad, is not the real Jesus. The cosmic Christ of New Age is not the real Jesus. The spirit brother of Satan in Mormonism is not the real Jesus. If you have two people named Robert Jones in the Vancouver telephone directory, which there almost certainly is, does that mean they're the same person? Many will come in my name, saying I am he, and mislead many. As long as it comes in the name of Jesus, people are buying into it, jumping, it must be the same Jesus. They don't understand the scriptures. I pointed out many times this was the problem with Baal worship. Baal is the Hebrew term for husband, master, and owner. Yahweh was Israel's Baal, your husband is your maker. The Baal of Israel was Yahweh, God. But the Canaanites also had a Baal who counterfeited him. In fact, their Baal rose from the dead every spring. You got a ball, we got a ball, they must be the same ball. Everybody's got to have a ball. Let's have unity. 
All of these things point to what Antichrist is going to do. Okay. What's today falsely called Judaism is not Judaism. Real Judaism can only come in two forms. One no longer exists and has not existed since 70 AD. Mosaic Judaism has not existed since 70 AD as Daniel and Jesus predicted. Then there's Messianic Judaism, Jewish people who believe Jesus is the Messiah, that's valid. That's the fulfillment of the Torah. Those two are valid. One no longer existing. What you see today and that is called Judaism is Talmudic Judaism. It is not real Judaism, it is Rabbinism. They are waiting for the Messiah, having rejected the real one. Christians are waiting for the return of Christ, but which Christ? New Age is waiting for Matriya, the cosmic Christ. Muslims are waiting for the Mahdi. Buddhists are waiting for the fifth Buddha. Everybody's waiting for somebody. When Antichrist comes, he knows how to be all things to all people. You understand? He's going to unite the world's false religions. That is what he is going to do. So when you see Rick Warren saying, we have to have a global peace plan and unite with people who worship other gods, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons, we have to unite with people who worship demons in order to bring in global peace. Again, that man works for Satan. He is a son of the devil. He is an agent of hell and nothing less. The elect are being deceived. Nobody says anything. Very few people. Some do, but not many. These things are outrageous. It would have been unthinkable to embrace Reverend Moon, a man who says he's the return of Christ. You got major evangelical leaders doing it. It would have been unthinkable for a preacher of the status of John MacArthur to say it will be possible to worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, worship the image of the beast, and after taking the mark, still be saved and go to heaven. That would have been unthinkable. The elect are being deceived. Don't you be deceived. The governments and the economy of the world will be given into the hands of Antichrist. The apostate church will merge into the false religious system of the world. That includes many people who call themselves evangelical. You've already got major evangelicals caving in on things like same-sex marriage, homosexuality, etc., including Hillsong. Unbelievable, but it's happening. Okay. That leaves the restrainer. Who is the restrainer? Jesus had three and a half years of public ministry. Satan is going to demand equal time. And within certain parameters, he's going to get it. They'll be given into his hand for two times a time and a half time. He will demand equal time, and he will get it. Let no one tell you differently. The stage is being set forward already. Yet all these things you see happening in the Middle East are setting the stage for prophecies like Zechariah 12 and so forth, for sure. And Revelation 16, for sure. Keep one eye on the Middle East, absolutely. But keep the other eye on the church. We're being set up. Not necessarily you and I, but the church itself is being set up. Satan has already had the Church of Rome in his back pocket. He's already had the Eastern Orthodox Church in his other pocket. He's already had liberal Protestantism in his shirt pocket. 
He's already had the cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, in his hip pockets. He's already had them. Now he's come after quote-unquote evangelicals. And it's happening. Believe me, friends, I have never wanted to be more wrong in my life. If anybody can show me that I've said anything that is not factually and biblically true, I'd be delighted. I've tried to prove myself wrong. Now, I'm not the only one saying these things. One of God's judgments is he removes godly leaders. After Campbell Morgan and F.F. F. Bruce and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, there were no more godly leaders in Britain. There were voices, but no more leaders of that stature. Theocrats took over, opportunists took over, false teachers and false prophets took over, but there was no standard anymore, as there was in the days of John Wesley or Charles Spurgeon. Now it's all gone. About 10, 12 years ago, I wrote something and I said, this is what happened in Britain. What is going to happen in North America when Chuck Smith and Dave Hunt and David Wilkerson are no longer with us? Well, they're no longer with us. Look what's happening. I wish I was wrong. However, there's another side of the coin. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. It's like birth pangs. No mother expecting a beautiful baby enjoys maternal contractions. There may be interim periods of respite, but they get worse before they get better. When the baby comes, however, the joy and the blessing so eclipses everything, the birth pangs are quickly forgotten. Well, so it will be when Jesus comes. You have people telling you, people who are committed to a pre-tribulational position are telling you the following. They're saying things like, you believe we have to identify the Antichrist before Christ comes. You're looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. Doesn't that sound religious and profound? You're looking for the Antichrist. You're waiting for the Antichrist. I'm waiting for Christ. What kind of an ignorant babbler approaching 40 weeks gestation would say, don't tell me about birth pangs. Don't tell me about contractions and maternal labor. I'm not looking for that stuff. I'm looking for the baby. <laughs> the baby's going to come without it. Lady, we got to have a long talk. <laughs> I don't normally lie, but when my wife was in maternal labor, I lied like a rogue. Every time that graph moved, I lied through my teeth. It's the last one, baby, I promise. I wouldn't lie to you. Now, in obstetric medicine, what happens when the baby doesn't come after 24 hours labor? They elect for a voluntary cesarean section, a C-section. The Greek word for that kind of surgical intervention, it's also the word for amputation in Greek, is kalobo, kalobo. Think of the rapture as a kalobo, a cutting short. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. The church becomes so worldly at the end of the age 
persecution becomes a necessary evil to get rid of the dead wood and to separate the bride from the harlot church. Many problems with persecution. Those who don't need to be persecuted get it first and worst. That's one of the problems. But it sure shows the genuine article. Again, I go to countries, I have to go to Vietnam in a few weeks. I go to countries where the church is persecuted. I see what it's like. I go to those countries, I go to there, I meet with the pastors in the underground church, and I teach them about the Word of God. They don't have much background or anything like that, or even ability to get it. I teach them about the Word of God. But they teach me what the Word of God is about. <laughs> There's a big difference. By the grace of God, I can teach those pastors from the Hmong tribe in Vietnam and Montagnards about the Word of God. I can teach them about the Word of God. But they teach me what the Word of God is about. There is a humongous difference. They're looking for his coming. They just went out of here. Every deception aimed at the church in the Western world today is to seduce us into trusting in this life and this world. What is on back of the word faith, blab it and grab it, name it and claim it, money preachers? Trusting in this world. What is on back of dominionism and kingdom now theology? Trusting in this world. What is on back of the purpose driven lie? Trusting in this world. This is what Jesus warned. It'll be like the days of Noah. They'll be marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking. Things that are not wrong in themselves, but they will be obsessed with the temporal. Well, the subject related to this one, but this restrainer. One of the things that people do with no basis linguistically, I challenge any of them. They make two Greek words synonyms. The word for tribulation in Greek is philipsis, philipsis. The word for wrath is orge, orge. We are not appointed unto wrath. The scriptures use wrath in one context, and philipsis in another. Jesus said you will have philipsis in the world. He said there will be a mega philipsis, but those days will be cut short. The first thing they have to do is give themselves a license to change the dictionary and lexical meanings of the words orge and philipsis. What is the hour of testing, the paresmos? We will not be here for wrath. Wrath is when God pours out his judgment on the kingdom of Antichrist. Wrath does not come from the devil. Wrath is God. That doesn't concern the faithful church. But the ellipsis? That comes from the devil. Do not mistake suffering tribulation from the devil with the wrath of God. They are two different things. To understand what it's going to be like after the rapture, one good way to do it is to read Josephus, Wars of the Jews. See what happens after the believers were rescued out of Jerusalem under Jesus' cousin Simeon following the martyrdom of James. They went through the tribulation up to a point, but they were taken out of the worst of it before the temple was totally destroyed and before starvation became so unspeakably terrible that they would wait for a woman to have a baby so they'd have something to eat. And then there would be food riots over the after... They'd have food riots to fight for the afterbirth, for the placenta. You read Joseph, it's incredible. That's going to happen to the whole world. What happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD is a microcosm of what's going to happen to the entire planet 
once the church is removed, it's going to go from bad to much, much, much worse. Much worse. Much worse. In any event, we come back to this idea of the restrainer. Who's restraining? Turn with me, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. What I'm going to do is translate each line, each verse, word by word, okay? Eratomen de humas, et del play huprates, parousias, tau curio himon, Jesu Christo, kai himon, episunagages, ep oto. We are asking yet you brothers, Hooper, over, or you can translate it over as in acting for the sake of you brothers, that the appearing or the, the coming presence, parousias, of the Lord, curio, uh, of us, our Lord, Himon, Jesu Christo. When the scriptures say Christ Jesus, it's Him in eternity. When it says Jesus Christ, it's him coming to earth, okay? When it says Christ Jesus, it's him in eternity. When it says Jesus Christ, it's him coming to earth. And here it is, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. End of us assembling. Epi synagogue. The Greek prefix epi means around. Synagogue. Get the word synagogue. It's a Greek word, not a Hebrew one. Let me explain epi synagogue. Resurrection. Anesthesia. Rapture, harpezo, snatching away. Anesthesia plus harpezo. Resurrection plus rapture equals episunagage, our gathering together to be with him. We meet the Lord in the air. The timing of this is his presence, the parousia. It happens at the parousia when he becomes phys literally present. Okay? Everybody understand? Now be careful. There are people who have redefined the blessed hope as the rapture. This is nonsense. The blessed hope is the parousia. The blessed hope is the episunagage. In the same epistle where he speaks of the blessed hope, Paul says, when a brother or sister in faith, a believer, gives up the ghost, do not overly mourn as those who have no hope. The dead in Christ have the same hope we do. <laughs> it does not matter if you're resurrected or you're raptured. We meet the Lord in the air. Everybody understand? Believers have always had the blessed hope. 2,000 years ago, they had the blessed hope. Paul wrote to Timothy, well, did Paul have the blessed hope? Yeah. Was Paul raptured? No. Well, he was in 2 Corinthians in some way, but he came back. You know. Do not let people tell you the blessed hope equals the rapture. It equals the ret episunagage, the return of Christ. The dead in Christ have the same hope as those who are biologically alive because they're not dead. They're asleep. Their bodies are asleep and they're in the presence of the Lord. They have the same hope. It doesn't matter if you give up the ghost before the Lord comes or if you're raptured. We all have the blessed hope, the episunagage. They will try to tell you the following nonsense, and it's nonsense. If you don't believe the rapture is the blessed hope, you won't have an incentive to live a moral life. <laughs> if you don't believe the Lord can come at any moment. The doctrine of imminency, as they call it. The doctrine of imminency is a truth, but it does not depend on the timing of the rapture. The Lord can come at any moment for any one of us. We can, any one of us can drop dead five minutes from now. Any one of us can go to sleep tonight and not wake up in the morning. 
Can the Lord come at any time? He can come at any time for anybody. It's always been like that. Imminency does not depend on the timing of the rapture. Never has. Remember Jesus told the parable of the guy who built two barns? He said, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Imminency does not depend on the timing of the rapture. Let's look. Verse 2. Aistome kekios seliuthenai humas apotonus mite throisetai mite dia numatos mi ete dialogo mi ete di epistolos hos di hemon hos hoti enesken he hemera tau Christo. Into the knot, into the knot swiftly to be shaken. Into the. There's going to be some kind of a maelstrom that's going to have the potential danger of sweeping believers into it, that is going to shake them. Remember, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But we're not supposed to be shaken. We're not supposed to be able to be shaken. Shaken you from the noose mind, nor in addition to that or next to that, being alarmed either through spirit, pneumatos. They think the Holy Spirit's telling them something, but it's not the Holy Spirit. They think it is, but it's not him. The Holy Spirit will never tell us something contrary to Scripture. Mete dia logo. Nor through word, somebody saying something. Nor or or next to, through an epistle. That is a letter, not a, a canonical epistle, but something that somebody has written. Or through us, as if we supposedly said it, that <clears throat> an iskin has in stood is present, that, that it's come the day of the Lord, that you not be shaken or troubled neither by spirit nor word, nor by letter as if from us, that the day of the Lord has come or is, is about to come, is that hand, you might say. Okay. Then he goes on. Verse 3. Metis humas ekepat Ekapatsi kata medina tropan hoti ian me ede he apostosia proton ke apocalypse. Get the word apocalypse. Ho anthropos tes hamartis, ho wios tes apoleis. Let no one deceive you by any means. Literally, not that you should be allowed to be seduced, seduced, according to any manner or method. That if ever may be coming, the apostasy must first, and may be from covered, that's what apocalypse means, uncovered. <clears throat> the human, that is Anthropos, the man of sin. Now some scriptures based on verse 7 also with Translated man of lawlessness, the anthropon enomon, um, hoios tes uh, uh, apoleis, the son of destruction, a pol like Apollyon. It says directly that it, the antecedent, being the day of the Lord, are gathering together to be with him, shall not come unless there is an apostasy apostasia, a falling away, and that the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, depending on your translation, I can handle either one, the son of perdition comes first. In the Greek language, it says directly, and in any translation that's anywhere accurate in any language, 
says directly. It's not going to happen until the Antichrist comes first. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, he's the first one on the white horse. That happens before the rapture in chapter 7, another story. Related but separate. It's not going to happen. Let he who has wisdom count the number of the beasts. Many will come. Why does the scripture give so much emphasis and stress as to identifying him if it doesn't concern us? That's ridiculous. Now, the pre trib people at their conference every year in Dallas had a debate with a preterist named Hank Canagraph. Bad news. But anyway, the pre-trib guy won the debate, Dr. Mark Hitchcock. He's a lawyer and a theologian and a good debater. A good brother, but pre-trib, and he debated Hanegraaff, and he, he beat him decisively. One of the, they were debating about the date of the book of Revelation, if John really wrote it at the end of the first century and so forth. The pre-trib people pointed out to the last historical link we have with the apostles. The last historical link we have with the apostles is the Papias Hegesippus Irenaeus axis of church history, pre-Nicene history, that says that John wrote Revelation at the end of the first century. It also says that the apostle John and the apostles and the early church believed we would have to know who the Antichrist is before the rapture. The early Christians did not believe pre-trib. The pre-trib research people admitted themselves. The early Christians did not believe it. The apostles did not teach it. I'm only stating a fact. The modern patriarch of pre-tribulationism is the former president of Dallas Seminary, Dr. John Woolward, a good believer and a good scholar. I say nothing bad about the man personally. I think he loved the Lord. And he was a credible scholar. In his book on the rapture, the patriarch of modern pre-tribulation scholarship, Dr. John Wolverd, said the following. There is no passage anywhere in scripture that literally teaches pre-tribulationism. We have to glean it <laughs> from an overview. You can glean anything from an overview. There is exegesis and asegesis. Exegesis is taking something out of Scripture that it says. Asegesis is reading something into Scripture it doesn't. They have no passage that says it. They admit there's no passage that says it, and they admit the early Christians never believed it, and that the apostles did not teach it. That's some case. To treat something as a virtual fundamental, as some of them do, when they admit it's not literally taught and the apostles never believed it? That's a very precarious argument. But they've got to do monkey tricks, somersaults with this. Now again, let's look at that verse 3. Ian me elfe. Ian me elfe. Some people believe the restrainer, and there are people today who still believe it in places like Northern Ireland, who hold to something known as historicism. They believed that the pagan government of imperial Rome was the restrainer because after Rome fell and after the emperor relocated his capital to Constantinople to Istanbul, the Roman papacy came to power and the pope is the Antichrist. They don't see the Antichrist as a specific person. They see the, the, the Antichrist as any pope. <laughs> this was a popular belief in the Reformation and it's still held by certain people in Northern Ireland and places like that. The pope is the Antichrist. Well, the Pope is an Antichrist. 
and he's a type of becoming Antichrist, but he's not the Antichrist. Okay. Not every pope is not the Antichrist. He is, every pope is an Antichrist. He takes the title in Latin, Vicarius Christus, Vicar of Christ. You translate Vicarius Christus, Vicar of Christ, into Greek from Latin, it's Antichrist. Every pope says, I am Antichrist. Anti means in place of, not just against, it means in place of. You know, the papacy is an antichrist institution. They're not completely wrong in what they say. In other words, they're right in what they say, they're wrong in what they don't. But to say, suggest that the pagan emperors who persecuted the church, these demonized madmen, like Nero and Caligula and Septimus Severitus and Marcus Aurelius and Decius and Diocletian, I mean, these were demon-possessed madmen persecuted the church. To say that they were the restrainer is, is a bit ridiculous. Others identify the restrainer as Michael the Archangel. Many pre-wrath people identify most of them as the restrainer as Michael. That unfortunately doesn't work too well. When we read in Revelation 12, Michael does not restrain Satan from coming to earth and inhabiting the Antichrist, he casts them down. They have a battle and kicks them out. Michael does the opposite function <laughs> of what the pre-wrath people say. Now the pre-wrath people are right about many things. They're right about the timing of the rapture. They're right about drawing a distinction between tribulation and wrath. They're right about the difference between the judgment of God and the persecution of Satan. They're right about many things. They're mostly right, but they get the restrainer wrong. Who is the restrainer? We read in verse 4, Ho antikimenos, kai uperomenos, o uperomenos, epipanten legomenon, theon e Sebasma hoste auton eston neon. Tau theo hosteon kathesai apodek nunta hotan hoti estin theos. The opposing one being lifted up or exalted and being said that he is God or being said God or venerated, the object of veneration, Sebasma. And next to him, or, or, or so that, into the temple of the God as God to be seated, demonstrating himself that he is God. Antichrist wants to be worshipped as God because he will be the incarnation of Satan. Satan has always wanted to be God. It goes back to Isaiah 14. Then he says in verse 5, Au nemoniote hosti etion pros humas taute elegon humen. You are remembering still an ongoing action towards you that I said these things to you. In other words, he's saying, not remember what I told you, he's saying, you are remembering what I told you. Now again, he says what's going to happen that's going to persuade people in the last days will be a method, a method. The method is asegesis. The method is not rightly dividing the word of God. They have no literal passage by their own admission that teaches it. They have no license to equate as synonyms or to make as synonymous terms uh, orge with ellipsis. They have no exegetical basis to conclude this. There's some method that they're going to be using. I will tell you some of the method that's being used now. One of these people, Thomas Ice, who agreed to debate me, then backed down, says the following. The great apostasy, the great falling away is the rapture. Even other pre-trib people don't believe that. 
but he does, and certain other ones, that's what they're saying. Now, the, the word apostasy it comes from an underlying Greek word, meaning to stand out, to stand out of, okay? Uh, to stand outside of. They take the underlying word and try to construct an etymological argument, okay? Uh, Apithai, but the word apostasia, as it's used in the New Testament, is always to depart from the truth. To depart from the truth, you apostatize. They just said, no, it just means depart. <laughs> Whoa. Here's another argument. Uh, it becomes, it, it gets more crazy. The apostasy is the rapture. What would you do if someone said, well, the rapture is not directly taught in Scripture, but it's still a doctrinal truth. And we can base doctrine not on what's literally stated, but on extrapolating it. You know, the way we do with the Trinity. The Trinity is not literally taught in Scripture. We extrapolate it. The Trinity is not literally taught in Scripture. Read the martyrdom of Stephen. The Spirit comes on him and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Read the Great Commission, not names, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Read John 14 and John 17. Jesus not only says there's three persons, he explains the dynamic of the interplay between the three persons. Yet T.A. McMahon, the person who inherited by default Dave Hunt's ministry, Dave Hunt never would have taught this, says the Trinity is not literally taught in Scripture. Paul Wilkinson, another pre-tribulational activist, says the Trinity is not literally taught in Scripture. We have to extract. That is exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. People are extrapolating something not directly stated. We had some former JWs here last night. Were they still here? Some former Jehovah's Witnesses? Am I right? They say it's not in there. People are extrapolating it. That would be music to the ear of any Jehovah's Witness. They're using a method. They're not rightly dividing the Word of God. They're doing monkey tricks with the text. The philosophical term for what they're doing, it's not theological, it's philosophical. It's called reductio ad absurdum. It can't mean what it states. It can't mean what it seems to say, so therefore it means something else. What it states blatantly and directly goes against our presuppositions, so therefore it can't mean what it plainly says. It has to mean something else. Reductio ad absurdum. <laughs> this is what they're doing. The, a theistic evolutionists do the same thing. It can't mean what it seems to say, so it must mean something. They use the same argumentation. It's reductio ad absurdum. It's a method. They're going to use a method to try to dissuade Christians from dealing with the plain meaning of the text. In the last days. Then it continues. Verse 6. Kainun tal, katakon. Katakon is restraining or better, detaining. Katakon oidete, esto apocalufathenai. To be uncovered, to be unveiled. Same, word as, same root word as apocalypse. Auto, uh, ento, hauto, kairo. In its season or in its hour. You could translate it in its hour, but better in its season. A time is going to come when it's going to be unveiled. Think of apocalypse this way. 
There is nothing new in God's Word doctrinally. It is all in there. There is no new revelation. But these things are sealed till the time of the end, Daniel is told. The closer we get to the return of Jesus, bear with me. The veil. For the faithful church, the veil will go up and they'll see clearer. For the apostate church, the veil will come down. They will see less. In the last days, understanding of the scripture becomes the barometer of faithfulness. Daniel says, none of the wicked will understand. The foolish virgins will have no oil in their lamps. They'll have Bibles as ornaments. Thy words are lamp to my feet, a light to my path, but they will not have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Bible will simply be a religious ornament. That's all. For the faithful church, the veil will go up. Apocalypses. It'll go up. For the apostate church, it'll come down. Do you notice how the level of biblical exposition has become less and less? You've got people week after week taking a few verses out of context and then they give anecdotes and tell stories and how the Lord dealt with them this week and stuff like that. <laughs> what they do? At best they read it devotionally. It's all motivational psychology using Christian jargon but there's less and less exposition of scripture. Less and less. At a time we should be getting deeper into God's Word to understand these things, they're getting further away from it. To the point where Rick Warren is saying, keep away from it, keep away from it, avoid it. The foolish virgins are going no place. And they are going no place fast. Hear what I said? The foolish virgins are going no place, and they are going no place fast. A time will come when they're going to realize they were wrong, but it's going to be too late. The time to get the oil in the lamp is now. For the Holy Spirit to show us these things. As the old time Pentecostals used to sing, give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. They were right. But the old time Pentecostals were very different than most of what you see, the nonsense you see today. The old time Pentecostals were quite different. They took the word of God seriously. Well, let's look. That he might be revealed in his season to be revealed. Until the time is right, even the faithful won't know. As we looked at last night, is there anybody who wasn't here last night? Okay. The Antichrist and Judas are both called the son of perdition, with a definite article, okay? They're both the son of perdition. Whenever you see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something about the Antichrist, the son of perdition. They were both into money. They are the only two people satanically possessed. Many were demon-possessed. But of Judas, it says, Satan entered him. Antichrist, the same. Only they are satanically possessed. Not just demon they're satanically possessed. Okay. The Antichrist may be demonically possessed to begin with, but a time is going to, he's going to be satanically possessed. Okay. When John the Apostle describes Antichrist in his first epistle of John, John is the last hour Antichrist is coming, he describes Antichrist in the character of Judas. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. The Antichrist, like Judas, Judas pretended to care for the poor, and he used that to disguise his real agenda. Antichrist is going to do the same. He's going to look like a wonderful humanitarian. I point you to my book out there. There's a book out there called Shadows of the Beast. We explain these things at length. Okay. Even the apostles didn't know who he was. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Not Judas. It can't be him. <laughs> this guy's going to be good. 
until Jesus revealed that the son of perdition, even the apostles didn't have a clue who he was. Until Jesus reveals the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, until Jesus reveals him, we're not going to have a clue. Remember, there'll be many antichrists. This one will be unique. One of the things that's going to make him unique is he's not going to show his true colors. He's not going to be conspicuously bad until a certain point, until that season. Think of Judas. Only Jesus knew who he was and what he was doing. <laughs> this guy's going to be good. As I warned last night, if you can't see through an obvious deceiver, if you can't see through an obvious false prophet, an obvious false teacher, if you can't see through Kenneth Copeland or, jo or Joyce Meyer or Benny Hinn, you're never going to see through this guy. Well, let's look. Verse 6. Kai nun to katakon, oidete es apocalyptinai, auton ento hotokairo. You know what restrains him. This catacomb. Who, what is the catacomb? Palgar mustidion. Ede enegete tis anomes manon ho catacomb arti hios ek mesu genetai. The close keep is already acting of the lawless one, or the one who is lawless, the enomon. Monon only, or however, the one down having at present till out of the midst may be becoming. The mystery of iniquity is already active. It's already working. It's a mystery, but mysteries are always unveiled to the faithful. Only he who restrains or who is operating, who is presently operating in the capacity of sequestering or detaining or restraining will do so until he is, we've translated, taken out of the way. That's not the best translation. The one detaining at present till out of the midst it may be becoming. In other words, it doesn't say he's going to go. It says he's going to go in the sense that he's not going to restrain anymore. In other words, you're holding a drunk back in a bar, and the bouncer's holding the drunk back from getting in a fight with another drunk. And the manager says, listen, let him go at it. Who cares? <laughs> Take them outside and let them fight. Let the police deal with it. Just throw them out. Keep them apart till you get them out the door. <laughs> so the bouncers take them out there. He stops restraining. The bouncer doesn't go away. He stands there and watches the fight. Okay? <laughs> That's what it means. He will go in the sense that he will stop restraining, but he will not stop to be present. The important Greek term is this. Ian germe epelto. I can't come until he goes, okay? I can't come until he goes. In ge me aperto. Now, turn with me, please, to John sixteen seven. Let's bring up the Greek of John sixteen seven.
El ego I am. El etien lego. I am saying to you what is true. Human sumferai. That it's being expedient or being accommodating to speed. Human hine ego aperto. Iem ger me aperto. Ho paraclitos. Oc elusatae pros humas iende prefio pemso auton pros humas. Nevertheless, or I'm telling you the truth, nevertheless, that it is expedient, or to your benefit, to your benefit, let's put it that way, that I go. For if I do not go, the paraclete can't come. Okay? If I don't go, the paraclete cannot come. So we contrast this. Ian me elte and Ian ger me aperto. If I don't go, he can't come. If I don't leave, the Holy Spirit can't come. If the Holy Spirit doesn't go, I can't come. You understand? John 16, 2 Thessalonians 2. If I don't go, he can't come. If he doesn't go, I can't come. Yeah. Yeah. The Holy Spirit was present in Jesus. Present in Jesus. But the only way the Spirit could come on us is if He went. There are two things we must understand. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20. We'll be finishing before too long. Verse 22, he's died for their sin, he's rose from the dead, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathes on them. At that point, there was regeneration, second birth. At that point, the apostles, the disciples were born again. He breathed on them, and they were born of the Spirit. When you were born again, when you first came to a saving faith in Jesus, Jesus breathed on you. Do you understand? He gave you his spirit. He made you a new creation. When you were born again, he breathed on you. No matter cause. He breathed on you. It goes back to the creation in Genesis. God breathed on Adam and became a living soul. Birth and second birth. Because of sin, man died, so he had to have a second birth. God had to breathe on him again. You understand? He had to breathe on him again. The same as he did in Genesis, he had to do it again. Sin killed. Jesus came, atoned for the sin, gave life, and then he breathed on him again. It had to happen a second time. That is for us. But then he told the apostles, go to Jerusalem and wait for the paraclete. Wait for the Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit inside of them. But the Holy Spirit did not unite and empower the church to preach the gospel, convicting the world. The word is eklikton, convicting the world of sin. That is the third thing that restricts Satan and evil, and that is the restrainer the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. When people's consciences are seared, they can no longer be convicted. But the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. He also empowers the church to reach the unsaved. He convicts the unsaved and empowers the church to reach them. Right now, between Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, there's a 10-day period in the Jewish calendar called the Days of Awe. 
but in Hebrew, the Hayamim Anoraim, literally the terrible days, a 10-day period. There was a 10-day period before the Day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, Hag Shavuot, and the Ascension of Jesus. There was a 10-day period. He sends, the rapture of Jesus was on the 40th day, Pentecost the 50th. In other words, there's this 10-day period in the spring, 10-day period in the autumn, okay? The church did not exist as such. It was just individuals. They were not empowered to reach the unsaved. The Holy Spirit was not convicting the unsaved. The Holy Spirit operated the way he did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only for certain people at certain times. Patriarchs, judges, high priests, kings, and prophets. Okay? Then the apostles get the Holy Spirit. But he's not poured out on the church yet to reach the lost, and he's not convicting the world. Pay attention. Once the faithful church is removed, once the rapture happens, once the rapture and resurrection take place, once the episunagage happens at the parousia, 85% of what the scriptures tell us is that God turns his focus back to dealing with Israel and the Jews. You understand? He overwhelmingly turns his focus back to dealing with Israel and the Jews once the faithful church is removed. Now, it's not 100%, but it's mostly that. He behaves the way he did in the Old Testament. Only certain people have the Holy Spirit, like the 144,000. Only certain people. God goes back, grace is over. He becomes the God who deals with man by wrath again. The same judgments you see against Egypt, commemorated in the Paschal Seder. Hoshek, darkness, blood, dam, frogs, fardaya. Those judgments are recapitulated in Revelation, aren't they? The way that Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron is the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. Most of what the scripture says shows the Lord turning his purposes back to dealing with Israel and the Jews. Okay? This notion that when the rapture happens, there's going to be a great revival after the rapture, this is crazy. Traditional pre tribulation people themselves didn't believe this. They used to believe, I wish we'd all been ready. Now they're saying the rapture is going to herald a great revival. Well, the book of Revelation tells us. God is going to be concerned mainly with the Jews, and secondly, that men would still not repent of their wicked deeds. It actually says that. They're inventing nonsense. They're inventing nonsense. God goes back to an Old Testament motif. Okay? The restrainer is the catacon, the catacon is the restrainer. God's Spirit will never be taken from the hearts of the true believers. Never. But he will be taken from the world. You understand? Just like in the days of Noah, Jesus said, my spirit will not forever strive with man. No, his spirit will never be taken from the believers, but it will be taken from the world. He goes back and dealing with them in wrath. He's concerned with Israel. The church is going to have this brief period. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. <laughs> the church won't exist. We'll all be underground. Being a Christian will be a crime. What happened to the Jews in the Holocaust of the 30s and 40s will happen to the church. Being a believer in Jesus will be a capital crime. Will we all be killed? No, but many will. But these sufferings are cut short by the rapture, the kolobo. Again, in conclusion, Ian ger me aperto, Ian me elte. If I don't go, he can't come. John 16. 
If he doesn't go, I can't come. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It is the Holy Spirit who's the restrainer. No, he will not be taken from the hearts of true believers. But he will be taken from the world. And he will no longer strive with man. And he will no longer unite and empower the church to reach the world. God's going to deal with the world through Israel. God's going to deal with the world unilaterally through divine judgments. He's going to deal with the world very differently than he does now. Grace will be over. The time of the Gentiles will be over. The age of the church will be over. Don't worry. His spirit will not be taken from us. But he will be taken from the world. He will no longer restrain. If I don't go, he can't come. It's to your advantage that I go so he can come. But then it's to your advantage that he goes so I can come. The catacomb, the restrainer, is the Holy Spirit. Be careful of those who tell you the Holy Spirit is the restrainer, but he's taken at the rapture. He's not. He's not. It'll be just like what happened at Pentecost. There'll be a period, the shattering of the power of the holy people. There will be that period at the end, at the fifth seal. Jesus comes between the sixth and seventh seal. The sixth seal is very quick. He comes between the sixth and seventh seal. The rapture, the parousia, is Revelation chapter 7. That's where it is. Okay, That's it. That's it. It's directly stated where it is. In the beginning, he said, if I don't go, he can't come. Now he's saying, if he don't go, I can't come. I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's not leaving us, but the world has had it. God bless.